Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was right after the tragedy of 9-11 and our whole country was in grief, the loss of so many lives. And I was on my way up to an event at Wilderness Trail, somewhat looking forward to it because I was going to be able to get away from some of the cable news and all the enmity and hatred between nations and people. Sometimes you really can't get away, can you? I got to Bristol, Virginia, and I was going to have some lunch at this restaurant. And after lunch, uh, as I was going back to my car, I noticed behind the restaurant was a nice little path and a pond, and it just seemed like it would be a very serene place to take an after-lunch walk. I got back there to the pond, and there was this 9-, 10-year-old boy who was uh, chucking rocks at a at a turtle that was sitting up on a limb hanging out over the water. And it went from rocks to a brick to half a cinder block, and fortunately his aim was not very good. And the turtle snoozed through the entire assault, which made the boy angrier. And he said, I'm going to go get my daddy to shoot that thing. And I said, well, now why would you want to do that? Because I think it's a snapper. It could be a danger to children. And I said, well, it seems to me that the poor turtle is the only one in danger. My irony was lost on him. He had found a new dangerous enemy, and he was not going to let me take it away from him. It's kind of senseless, isn't it, really? Um, our human proclivity, if we don't have a real enemy, we'll make one and, or we'll find one. Isn't that what the folly, the tragedy of racism that we've been facing again this week? What's it all about, this chasm between people of different races? Is it the color of someone's skin, really? All this was grievous unto Jesus. Hostility between people and nations, the enmity. He was on his way to Jerusalem. Remember back in Palm Sunday when he came around the bend and there he could see the city. You know what Jesus did? Jesus wept. And he said, oh, if you only knew Jerusalem, the things that make for peace, and Jesus wept. And Jesus didn't go around Jerusalem. He went right on through it. And the one who came as love remained reconciling, peacemaking love. And we know where that got him. But now, you see, the 20th chapter, John, it's the resurrected Jesus, and he comes into that room of that little frightened group of followers that were like a little frightened covey of quail in there. And, and look, he had gone up against some of the apostles of hatred and treachery, and they tried to snap his life like a twig, and you think he would have come back with a stronger message, like, let's carry a bigger stick, let's fight fire with fire. That's not what he says. He said, peace be with you. He said that with broken places and the scars and still there in his side and there in his hand. He didn't just say it once, he said it twice. Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. For the same way, for the same purpose, to be peace, to speak for peace, even if they kill you for it. Now, we need to know right here at this point, um, when Jesus used the word peace, it was a much larger word. It was more like shalom is a larger word. When we think of peace, well, it's not a bad word, but we think about absence of war, no conflict, no argument, no fighting, um, tranquility, 
no disagreement between people. And that's the beginning of the biblical notion of peace. But for Jesus and those Jews that were his first followers, it meant complete wholeness. It, it, it meant things like um, everyone had everything they needed, enough food and good sleep and physical safety. It meant children and grandchildren laughing in the yard. It meant the uh, trees loaded with figs and with olives and the vine heavy with the grape. And it meant more than that. Beyond one's own family, it meant um, good relations between neighbors and nations who shared fairly the riches of creation. It meant more than that. It meant a world in which there were no strangers or enemies because no one was trying to take anything from anyone else. It meant peace with justice. If peace didn't include everyone and everything, it wasn't peace yet. If it wasn't good for the whole creation, it wasn't good for anyone. <laughs> Shalom, peace. When Jesus used that word, it meant roundness, completion, total relatedness. God's peace, God's shalom. I cannot think of a more grievous violation of shalom than that of racism. Nothing in American history is more tragic, surely, than the relationship of the black and white races. It all started in 1619 when that first slave ship showed up on the shores of Virginia. And then we had those centuries of slavery in which um, both masters and slaves were dehumanized. And then even after emancipation, there were the Jim, Jim Crow laws that carried on the process for decades and it has not gone away. Despite all the efforts of people from both races to rectify the situation, to heal the wounds. It's still among us. Um, the inequity and the discrimination still faced by black persons. And now we've been reminded that that often, too often leads to harassment and the death of George Floyd. We've seen that sometimes it actually means the taking away the breath and the life of black persons. Now here's the problem when people like us start in a worship service talking about racism. We think the danger is, is always out there. There's a really good program here in town. Um, it's been going on for years. It's been bringing black and white people together. It's built, the program's called Building Bridges. In fact, we've hosted it here numerous times at Central. They put out a very interesting graph. It's called an iceberg graph. And here's this like water line, and above that water line represents covert, socially unacceptable racism. What do you find that little bit above that line? Well, you'll find lynching and hate crimes, the N-word, swastikas, neo-Nazis, burning of crosses, KKK. But by far the largest part of the graph is below the line. It's us, many of us, all of us, you might say, covert, socially acceptable racism. Like, like what? Well, um, hiring discrimination. How about um, assuming that being civil or good intentions are enough? Or how about not challenging in the workplace when racist jokes are told? Or how about saying things like, well, why am I to blame? I never owned slaves. Look, here's the truth. We need to accept it. When we talk about racism, we're talking about a 400-year history of systemic evil. When we talk about systemic, that means everyone. All of us are marinated in a culture of bias and discrimination. You know marination. You put a piece of meat into the marination long enough and the whole lot of it becomes saturated. The problem's not just out there. Here's what I believe. In regards to this issue, until we meet up with the shadow in ourselves, we cannot do battle 
We cannot fight the shadow we will not own. The first step, I think back to the vision of Shalom, is really honest confession. We've already done that in this service. We said, God, none of us have lived up to all that you had in mind for this world or for ourselves. Um, we have not loved you or we have not, certainly not always loved our neighbor. And we've often forgotten the cry of the needy. It, it begins, I think, our way forward or back to Shalom, however you want to say it with honest confession that then leads to genuine repentance. And that's going to be the hope of this meal. We're going to come here as the people that have laid out our lives honestly before God. And once again, we receive the fresh grace of God, which should empower us to rise up out of our brokenness and brush ourselves off and then to say enough is enough. I, I, I'm determined to get up and move in a new direction. That's, that's what I heard from our staff, and I've heard from many of you, but it was a very hard moment on Tuesday morning when we came together as a staff. And this is what I heard us saying through our voices and our sharing with one another. No more, uh, no more just um, being satisfied with uh, good intentions. N no more um, just the silence, the, the silence that becomes complicity. No more being satisfied. Well, we had an interracial service last year. Know what I heard from the staff, it's time for us to get up, to start changing ourselves, and with new determination to do everything we can to change the world. I think it was this week I came across a reading by Leslie Dwight, very interesting. This is how it was penned. What if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? A year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, it awakens us from our ignorant slumber. What if 2020 is a year we finally accept the need to change, declare change, work for change, become change? A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other farther apart. 2020 is not canceled. May we be stewards of the pain that leads us to be stewards of change. How do we find our way back to shalom with confession that gives way to change? And let me also suggest by a deeper use of our God-given imagination. We all have that, you know. This is wonderful picture taking power of the mind to get out of ourselves for a few moments to try to sit where someone else sit, to try to find our way into someone else's life. Now, we can't do that in an all-knowing, perfect fashion. I mean, when we talk about relationships, we're always talking about a degree of mystery. When I talk about trying to journey into the mind and the heart and the experience of someone else, well, that's a journey toward a shore that we never completely or finally reach. And it would be naive for me to say that as a white male, I could ever fully and totally know what it's like to be black in America, however, I can quicken my imagination. I can try. I can try to take several steps into understanding someone else's story. My mother was good at trying to do that for me. I was 17 years of age, a junior in high school, living in Jacksonville, Florida, and word came there's going to be a really hard freeze. It was between Christmas and New Year's, and that meant trouble for the orange crops that were mainly out in Mandarin, a little town just south of Jacksonville, but that meant good, easy money for a high school kid. You could go out there and make a, good, a, a nice little bundle of money in a day by carrying out the smudge pots and, 
and, and lighting them. It was hot, dirty, not hot work, it was cold, but it was kind of dirty and heavy work. And on the second day, it was the coldest of the two days, and I had done my part. It was the end of the day, and I found my way back to the dirt road, going back to where we parked. And along came the boss man. He was in his pickup truck, and I gave him a wave and flagged him down. He came toward me, slowed down, and stopped, and I reached for the door to the passenger seat and began to get up and get in and he turned not just toward me he turned on me and he said get your blankety blank out of this truck out of this cab don't you know who you are boy you're a member of the crew and the crew always rides in the back okay. well I was still well, I still had a ride and so I climbed in the back and I knew it was going to be kind of a fairly long and bumpy ride, and oh, it started to rain, cold, almost icy rain, had no raincoat, not much of a jacket. Boy, I had a litany of complaint. You should have heard me inside. Oh, this just isn't right. This is terrible. This shouldn't happen. Well, I couldn't let it go, you know. I got back to my car, and I got home, and we were having supper, and I gave my, my parents just a, a, an earful of my bitter complaint, and my mother listened, and she said, how long was the ride? I said, 45 minutes. She said, it must have been very uncomfortable. And then she repeated the question. She said, now, how long was the ride? And I said, 45 minutes. And she looked at me, and she said, well, look, by the way our world is put together, that may be the last 45 minutes like this you'll ever have in your life. But she said, there are people, and they're your black brothers and sisters, and see, that's their story every day. No, you're not in the front of the room. You, you best go to the back of the room. No, your place is not in front of the bus. It's the back of the bus. And then she told me about Rosa Parks, this black woman in Montgomery, Alabama. Truth of the matter is, this is part of the story a lot of people miss, she was sitting on the front row of the colored section. And a white man got into the bus, and it was a crowded bus that day, and the driver saw that, well, there were no real seats left, so he told Rosa Parks, you get up, and you go all the way to the back. And something in her said, enough is enough. She didn't rant, she didn't rave, but she didn't move, and she sat there, and she was booked and arrested. You see what my mother was trying to do? Mm. She was trying to stir something up in me. She, she was asking me to get out of myself for a little bit and to ponder and to wonder and to feel like what would it be like day in, day out to being told you're not, well, you're a citizen, but you're really a second-class citizen, and your place is always in the back. Jesus, oh, he did everything he could to encourage this gift. We were given this gift at birth. A lot of us park it, left it back there as children, but we ought to carry it with us. And Jesus did everything he could to quicken it, to stir it up, to... Um, bring it under the captivity of the truth and spirit of God. Isn't that one reason, as Anne said this morning, he liked to speak in these parables and these stories to make us see and make us feel. And there was that story he told. It was kind of a dark story, but it was a powerful story about old Dives. You know, every day Dives went out to the gate and went out into town. He, oh, and he walked by the beggar at the gate and Never said a thing, never did anything for him. What's wrong with I, oh, Dives? Oh, nothing was wrong, except he had no imagination. He just never saw the beggar, at least as a human being. He never crossed the road into beggar land to feel what the beggar felt. I wonder if so much of our dark history of discrimination could have been changed at times if we had been stewards of our God-given moral imagination. How do we find our way back to shalom or forward to shalom? Confession, change, imagination. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Well, let's be sure. If we're going to make that our path, it's going to be a long path. 
oh, it's going to be a long obedience in the same direction. There are going to be no surefire programs. There are not going to be an easy solution. There will be no shortcuts. There will be no overnight results. It means long bouts of prayer and sturdy and steady willfulness. Those of us that are going to be determined to be a part of that journey, we better know that there will be moments in which we say, um, are we really making any difference here? Is there anything changing? Howard Thurman knew about that. He was a black theologian. He was also the preacher at the Marsh Chapel at Boston University. Interesting, during the years he was the theologian and chaplain there across the street was Boston Divinity School um, where Martin Luther King was a student. So Howard Thurman, he preached this sermon and it was called um, New Freedom. And he spoke to so many of his people who had been in the civil rights struggle and they were getting tired and disillusioned and disappointed. And he tried his best to speak to that with this anonymous poem. You say the little efforts that I make will do no good. They will never prevail to tip the hovering scale where justice keeps in balance. I do not think I ever thought they would, but I am prejudiced beyond debate in favor of my right to choose which side shall feel the stubborn ounces of my weight. Stubborn ounces of my weight. In the unfinished business of life, the challenging and sometimes imperfect work to which we call. This, this is the question before us, I think, right here, right now, today, 2020. How will we exercise our right to choose which side shall feel the stubborn ounces of our weight? We know which side. It's the side of shalom the side of peace. And if that seems to you today like a dream that's too long in coming, remember it is God's dream. And who are we but dreamers, believers in resurrection, in things unseen, in the triumph of life over death? I remember. Remember how when Jesus said it, that the hurt places were still visible on his body. And he said not once but twice, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you.